welcome everybody to tonight's episode of the Waterstof podcast. I am Thijs, this year's scalability manager. And next to me is Sean, our team manager. Tonight, you are part of a very special episode where we will present our Eco 40. Absolutely. But first, let's take a look at the reason why we built this car. Thijs, could you share your opinion with us? Of course. A few weeks ago, I had a very interesting conversation about innovation and change. Two things from this conversation became clear. That we need courage and vision in the energy transition. We need courage to make change, and with the right vision, we can move towards a brighter future. At the Climate Conference of Paris, the EU set a goal to be climate neutral in 2050. But our energy system is still reliant on fossil fuels. And to reach this climate neutrality, this has to change. Individuals and companies need to show the courage to change. Luckily, all sorts of projects are popping up. Wind parks are built all over the North Sea. More and more solar panels are placed on roofs. And even our king, opened the construction of a large hydrogen network last October. This will help us towards a sustainable future. But more change is needed in the way we live, eat, and transport ourselves. Yes, and that's true. And in addition, there are multiple other reasons that need, uh, there are multiple other factors that need to change in order to get to the sustainable future. The industry uh, has to make a big leap in becoming more efficient since the transport industry is responsible for more than 20%. And efficiency is also a core value we highlight at EcoRunner. The automotive industry has to make a trade-off between comfort versus efficiency. And comfort, of course, means more weight. And more weight means a lower efficiency. And that's a tough choice for the industry. Yes, true. Our car is built different. We focus on efficiency. We show that the vehicle doesn't always have to be big and heavy. Because cars are getting bigger and bigger, while the average numbers of passengers is only 1.4. So driving your five-seater SUV to work every day isn't the most efficient mode of transport. Maybe Xiao could uh, show us a more efficient mode? So EcoRunner started in 2005 with a group of 11 students who built a very efficient petrol-powered car. And then the second team saw the potential to use hydrogen as a fuel. So they made a car that was very efficient and run on hydrogen, and named the Eco H2. And back then, hydrogen cars were still a concept and not seen on the public roads. And uh, this design kind of evolved into a very bullet-shaped uh, vehicle. Awesome. This almost looks like a rocket. Uh but could I see this in the front of my house very soon? So unfortunately, not anytime soon, because the shape is still a concept, and this concept is far removed from reality. And therefore, in 2020, we decided to move from the so-called prototype class to the urban concept class to design a vehicle that's way more implementable to our society. This required the driver to sit up instead of laying down, and the uh, design required windscreen wipers and car lights. Well, this looks a bit more like a normal car, but is it still as efficient as the bullet uh, shape? So it is not as efficient as the prototype class, but with years of improving this urban concept class, we still have an efficiency which is far above the industry standards. And by focusing on the powertrain, the aerodynamic body, and also the use of lightweight materials, we have uh, managed to set a Guinness World Record last year. By driving almost 2,500 kilometers using only a kilogram of gas, uh, hydrogen, we've <laughs> <laughs> hydrogen, we've managed to set a Guinness World Record by uh, and officially became the world's most efficient hydrogen-powered city car. Amazing and on hydrogen! Wow. What will EcoRunner do this year to top this? So EcoRunner will show this courage again. We want to show that this concept is not just something that will stay on circuits and participate in races. We want to show that our concept is way more uh, efficient and uh, we want to show that the industry, that our efficiency is actually reality and that it is really relevant for society to focus more on our efficiency. 
So we take a big step towards a car that can actually drive on the public roads while maintaining this very high efficiency. And we call this street legal, meaning that you could see this car driving next to ordinary cars while you're driving home from work, for example. So I could use the Eco Runner as a day-to-day -day car to do my groceries. Cool. Um, but what is actually the current record for a legal hydrogen car? So the world, world record currently lies in the hands of the industry. Toyota holds the record for world's most efficient hydrogen car for the public roads. The Toyota Mirai is able to drive approximately 1,300 kilometers without refueling. But we aim to do this better by driving approximately 2,056 kilometers using 1.45 kilograms of hydrogen. And of course, we will not do this on a circuit. Maybe you guys recognize this route? So we will travel to Friesland to drive the famous Elfstedentocht, the most known uh, historic ice skating route in the Netherlands. And at the entrance, you could already see some pictures of previous editions. But unfortunately, it has not been able to take place for more than 25 years. And that's why it's time for action. And it's time to change the mobility sector to benefit the climate. We will drive this route with a hydrogen car, without any emissions, except, of course, for pure water. We will not simply drive this route once, but we will try as many rounds as possible, driving for three days straight during day and night to reach the 2,056 kilometers as our target, which are approximately 10 rounds, but with a larger potential distance in our mind. By doing this, we bring our sustainable solutions closer to society, and hereby we accelerate a sustainable future. is moving faster than ever. Energy demand is rising, but our planet cannot keep up. Luckily, humans have always been problem solvers. So we know sustainable solutions are out there. How do you think we can make it happen? We believe green hydrogen can take us there. But we need to work together, efficient, smarter, Foster. For the first time, we're moving from concept to reality. By setting a world record on the public road. This is how we accelerate the future. Are you joining us? Hi, I'm Arno, this year's chief engineer. And next to me is Adrian, our project manager. And we will take over this part of the podcast. Thank you, Arno, for introducing us. Now, our year looks something like this. It can be divided into four different stages. We start by designing the car. We move on to production, testing, and finally, to prove what we've made, a world record attempt. So we started out in the design phase. During the design phase, we set a goal to build a car that would drive the public roads. But uh, Adrian, how do we take on such a challenge? Well, in order to design a street legal car, we first needed to know what street legal actually means. And for that, we have designated a person in our team, our certification manager, Diego Datema. He started the year by looking for the right regulations that we should follow for our design. And he found all kinds of guidelines and regulations from both the UN and the EU. And uh, now it turns out that different countries can use all these guidelines and regulations in order to ensure the safety on their roads. It also turns out that the Netherlands is actually one of the safest countries in the world when it comes to cars. This, of course, means more rules, more requirements, and so for us, more of a challenge. Now, we still did not know which regulations to use exactly for our design. 
So we went ahead and scheduled a meeting with a Dutch organization called the RDW, who are responsible for setting these rules in the Netherlands. So we had a meeting with uh, the RDW, and we were quite happy to actually have this meeting, as they're responsible for the safety on the public road. And by having this meeting, they accepted to work with us, which, uh, of course, for them would be way easier to not trust the student team making a hydrogen bomb. But uh, we also got something else out of this meeting, right, Adrian? Yeah, well, we concluded that in order to know which regulations we should use, we first needed to choose which type of car we wanted to build. And after investigating the different possibilities, we decided to go for the L7E A2 category. Now, for the non-car specialists in the room, you can recognize this type of car by its squared yellow license plate. So now that we had chosen a specific category, the RDW could give us, could give us an overview of all the regulations that we should follow for our design. And with those regulations, we could make a list of requirements and start designing our car. Isn't that right, Arno? Well, not really. Uh, it ha just happens to be that the class that we chose uh, did not have any legislation on hydrogen, which meant that we would have no requirements for our car. Luckily here, again, the RDB and its ministry helped us, and we now had a final set of requirements. And this was a long list. The complete list of design requirements for a street legal eco-runner contains 1,301 requirements. <laughs> and these are all kinds of requirements. For example, requirements about the minimal braking distance or about the necessary set of actions in order to both start and lock the car, but also requirements for a defogging system for the front window and many different requirements for the geometry and visibility of the nine different types of lights we need to have in our car. Now, when designing with these design requirements, we constantly had to make the trade-off between on the one hand, the safety of our vehicle, and on the other hand, its efficiency. So this brought us to the production phase. Uh, we have the design of our car ready, and uh, this is the phase where we are in right now. Right now, we're busy assembling our car. We're soldering our PCBs, we're CNC milling aluminum for the suspension, for example, and we are sanding the carbon fiber. And in less than a week, we'll be bringing all of these parts together uh, to bring the assembly of our car, which will be exciting. Yeah, that's true, and afterwards, we'll enter the testing phase. Now this is the moment we get validation out of our design and see if our car is safe enough to drive the public roads. Now there are four major tests that we have to pass in order to get a license plate. These are the steading test, the EMC test, the hydrogen test, and the dynamic test. So the first test is the static test. This will be the first day that we see uh, the RDB in person and they'll have a little feel for our car and mainly go through all of the requirements. Then we have the EMC test. The EMC test is a complicated test where our electronics will be thoroughly tested and it's an important one for us, but uh, you'll hear more, more about that later. Now furthermore, there are the hydrogen tests. During these tests, the safety of our hydrogen system is thoroughly inspected by checking for leakage, detectors, and the materials that are used. Then we finally move on to the dynamic test. Now this is the moment that the handling of our car is tested, mainly focusing on the safety of our braking and steering systems. And then we have finally passed all those tests and obtained our license plate. It is time to demonstrate the efficiency of our street legal hydrogen powered car on the public road during the world record attempt. So now that you guys know the timeline of our car, uh, let's go back to the design. So we have finished the design of our car, and uh, it was a long road, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of late nights. But uh, we now have a final design, and uh, we can't wait to show it to you. So let's just get into it.
Wow, that is such a beautiful car, Adrian. I must say, I must say. But uh, I was having a look at all those moving parts. I wonder, how does all of that work? Well, in order to explain that best, I would like to invite our Chief Vehicle Dynamics, Emmanuel, to the podcast. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I am Emmanuel, I'm this year's Chief Fecal Dynamics, and together with the other two Fecal Dynamics engineers, we are responsible for the connection between the body of the car and the road. So tell me Emmanuel, was this a big challenge for you? After all, this was the first time you were designing a street legal car, right? Yes, this was of course a very big challenge for us, since we had to meet all of the requirements set by the RDW, since we wanted to drive on the public road which also meant that we had to make all of our parts more reliable than previous eco-runners. So, let's dive into how it actually works. Right now, we are looking at the top view of the Eco 14. And since we want to drive, of course, we need wheels, of which we have four. But we have one very important wheel, which is located in the rear left of the vehicle. This is our driven wheel, and inside of this wheel you will find an electric motor. In order to connect our electric motor wheel to the body of the car, we make use of a component called a trailing arm, which looks something like this. But right now we are looking at the double trailing arm design from last year's Eco 13. However, since we wanted to drive on the public road this year, it also meant that we had different driving conditions, and therefore we had to choose a different motor. Eventually, we chose a different motor, but this motor was designed in such a way that the wheel could only be connected at one side. And therefore, the double trailing arm uh, design was no longer feasible, and we had to explore alternative designs. So, we designed a single trailing arm. Creating the single trailing arm was a great technical challenge, since there was an increased need for torsional stiffness, because the upwards force on the wheel will cause the arm to twist which, of course, we want to prevent. So, I'll now explain in more detail how we actually designed a part like this. First, we started by reading all of the requirements set by the RDW. Then we looked at previous designs, and we read a lot of mechanical engineering books, and we did a lot of Googling, and eventually we could start designing. For the vehicle dynamics department, there are two very important criteria that we have to keep in mind when designing our components. We want to maximize our stiffness, but we also want to have a very low weight, so we can drive the furthest possible distance. And in case of the single trailing arm, especially the torsional stiffness was important, since we don't want our arm to twist. So, in order to validate our design, we made use of the finite element method technology, and in short, we call that FEM. Right now, we are looking at the FEM of our final design, and red parts indicate areas of high stress, while the green and blue parts indicate areas of lower stress. By looking at the parts where the lower stress was prevalent, we could make cutouts and in this way save weight. At the same time, we are also simulating how much the arm would twist, and we made sure to keep it in a reasonable amount. But, besides the single trailing arm, which is a part of our rear suspension, the vehicle dynamics department is also responsible for the front suspension, the braking system, the wheels, and the steering system. So let's now have a more in-depth look into the steering system. For the steering system, we also faced significant challenges this year. Of course, we have many new requirements set by the RDW, but we also wanted to create a feeling of safety while driving the car, to really convince the RDW that our car is safe, which meant uh, that we had to make our steering system resistant to bumps, meaning that we didn't want the wheels to twist in another way when driving over bumps. And at the same time, we wanted to make steering easier, so that less effort is required to turn the steering wheel. But there were also some very odd requirements of the RDW, which truly showed that the Eco 14 is unlike any conventional car. For example, there was one requirement that stated that we needed a steering lock and we need a steering lock to prevent unauthorized usage. However, it was also mandated that the steering lock could withstand a force of 200 newton meters. And for our car, that is an insane amount of torque, since our new electric motor can only deliver a peak torque of 16 newton meters. 
So that means that our steering block had to withstand almost four times the torque that our own electric motor could deliver. So those were, of course, a lot of challenges. But in order to, uh, um, to tackle these challenges, we decided to choose for a rack and pinion system, as you can see right now. In simple ter terms, when you turn the steering wheel, a gear rotates and a rack will move. The rack movement will cause your tie rods to either push or pull against your wheels, and in this way, you achieve steering. It is actually the first time that we have implemented a steering system like this in the EcoRunner. But because the rack and pinion system has a gear ratio, it makes the steering effort a lot easier because of the gear ratio. And therefore, we thought it was worth the extra challenge. At the same time, while we were designing this, we performed many kinematic simulations to optimize our steering geometry and to make sure that bump steer would be fixed. And therefore, we could safely drive over bumps with not a lot of steering effort. So, in conclusion, the vehicle dynamics department makes many parts, and we mostly focus on the stiffness and the strength of these components. And we also want them to be as light as possible so we can drive the furthest possible distance. However, this year there was an extra focus on the safety part, since we wanted to meet all of the requirements set by the RDW, but also because we wanted to create a feeling of safety while driving the car. Wow, Emmanuel, that steering system looks, looks very complicated. Uh, I was wondering, what was uh, the most complicated decision for you? Well, there were many, of course, but I think it has to be the single trailing arm, since our decision to, for our final motor came actually quite late. So we had to adapt very quickly from our double trailing arm to our single trailing arm. Wow, that sounds like a tough, tough decision. Yeah. Emmanuel, thank you for joining the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Emmanuel. Now let's move on to see what actually powers all these movements. Well, for that, we first have to understand what hydrogen is and what it can do. So let's invite our operations manager, Julie, to teach us some more about hydrogen. Yes, thank you, Adrian. So my name is Julie, and today I'll be giving you guys a short crash course on hydrogen. What is it, and why do we use it? For without hydrogen, our car would not be able to drive. And make sure you pay attention, because I will also be asking you some questions throughout. All right, let's start. So what is hydrogen? Hydrogen is the lightest element in the universe, and it is located at the top of the periodic table. Each atom consists of one proton and one electron. But when we speak of hydrogen, we usually mean the molecule, dihydrogen, which is when two separate hydrogen atoms form a bond with one another. And not only is hydrogen the lightest element in the universe, but it is also the most abundant. Almost our entire planet consists of 70% of hydrogen. But hydrogen does not occur naturally in the atmosphere, but it needs to be extracted from other molecules, such as methane or water. And this separation requires energy, which is what makes hydrogen an energy carrier rather than an energy source. You could see it as hydrogen being something of a battery, where we first have to give energy, which we can then store in the form of hydrogen, and then release it at a later moment whenever we need it. And the production of hydrogen can happen in many different ways. And each method corresponds to a different color, which gives us almost an entire rainbow of hydrogen. But we can distinguish three main colors. The first is gray hydrogen, which is where hydrogen is extracted from methane in the process of steam methane reforming. And besides hydrogen, this process also has carbon dioxide as a byproduct, which is released in the atmosphere and then increases the greenhouse gas concentration. The next one is blue hydrogen, which uses the same process, but now the carbon dioxide is captured and stored underground, so it can no longer contribute to global warming. And then there's the third and most optimal method, which is green hydrogen, 
which is where we use green energy to make hydrogen out of water. Okay, so this already brings us to our first question. What percentage of the hydrogen produced today is green hydrogen? And now Thijs, our scalability manager over there, is walking around with a blue talk box. And if you think you know the answer, you can raise your hand and he'll pass the box to you. So. Is your question over there? <laughs> What must I do, you man? All right. You have to speak in. Yeah. Zero. Zero. Wow. Well, luckily it's a little more than that, but it is not that much. It's only one percent. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And this. And this, I can imagine, for most of you, does not sound like a lot which is because the green hydrogen production is still in its infancy. But, as Thijs also already said, there are many projects underway to ramp up this green production of hydrogen in the near future. So when we as EcoRunner refer to hydrogen, we refer to green hydrogen, because this is the best for the environment. So let's take a quick look at how this process works. The process is called electrolysis. And here, water molecules are split into hydrogen and oxygen with the use of green electricity, for example, from solar or wind power. And then once hydrogen is produced, it can be used in many different ways. So this already brings us to the second question, which is, for what applications can we use hydrogen? Okay, any hands? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to throw it. And then you have to answer. <laughs> Ooh, very high up. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, you can use it to power a boat, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or a car. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. This is our, from our fellow T, uh, Dream Hall mates uh, from the Hydro Motion team, I think. Uh, and exactly, it can be used to also power boats. And when we talk about uh, the applications of hydrogen, we usually put them into three different sectors. The first is the industry, which is where it can be used for the production of green feedstock or green steel, for instance. And then the second is for heating also mainly for the industry, but it could also be to warm up our own houses. And then there's the third one, which is where hydrogen can be used as a green fuel for the mobility industry. So, for example, to power a boat or a car. And this is where we as EcoRunner focus on. And for all these applications, the main benefit of using hydrogen compared to, for example, electricity, is that it can be moved and stored quite easily which means that we can store high, uh, renewable energy in the form of hydrogen and transport it all over the world. And another benefit of using hydrogen is that it has a very high energy density, which means that we can store a lot of energy at a low weight cost. So if we zoom in to what this means for the mobility sector, this already brings us to the last question of this course. How much further could our eco-runner drive on one kilogram of hydrogen compared to one kilogram of gasoline? I think it's 100 times more. 100? Wow, if only that were true. No, it's uh, a little closer to three times further. <laughs> Which means, this means that if we were to start in Delft, on one kilogram of gasoline, we could drive to around Paris. But if we were to take the same amount of hydrogen, we would end up all the way in Barcelona. Okay, so this was already almost it for this uh, short crash course, and I'll give you a few key takeaways to keep in mind for the rest of the presentation. One, hydrogen is an energy carrier and not an energy source. Two, hydrogen can be used and produced in many different ways. And three, 
Hydrogen has a very high energy density. All right, thank you all for listening, and uh, I'll give the word back to our podcast. Wow, very interesting to learn all these new things about hydrogen. Thanks, Julie, for explaining. Now, Arno, do you know how hydrogen is actually used to power our car specifically? That's a very good question, Adrian. I think there's one person that could really answer this question well. It is our uh, chief powertrain and electronics. Let's invite Stenderon on the podcast. <laughs> Hi, Stan. We were uh, discussing about how hydrogen powers our car, and we were thinking, what are all the changes to the powertrain and electronics department this year? Well, Arno, that's a great question, because, because of all the requirements this year and the different driving conditions that we'll be having, almost everything is new at the powertrain and electronics department. So let's dive right into it. And let's start with the powertrain. The powertrain is the root through which energy flows through the car. First, in the form of hydrogen, then electricity, and finally, into movement of the actual car. And here on screen, you can see uh, the powertrain of Eco 14. And let's dive a little deeper into this and start with the hydrogen system. This, is, uh, this all starts with the hydrogen tank, where we store our hydrogen. And this is already one of the places where we made a big change compared to last year. As last year, the EcoRunner stored its hydrogen in five small tanks. This year, we do it in one big tank. Because of the many safety regulations, we needed to have a separate pressure regulator and safety valves on every tank. So by using only one tank, we could make our hydrogen system safer, simpler, and lighter. This one tank is a little bit bigger, and due to its size within the team, it's got the nickname Big Bertha. But unlike, uh, unlike its size, uh, it's on a strict diet and it's made out of lightweight carbon fiber and aluminum. And it can store our hydrogen for 60 liters at 350 bars to make a total of 1.45 kilograms of hydrogen. This hydrogen then flows from the tank to our fuel cell. And this is where the magic happens. This is where the hydrogen is combined with oxygen from the air and it makes water and electricity. Uh, because we are in pursuit of the highest efficiency possible, uh, we are not afraid to look at other industries to, for imp inspiration. And this is why uh, our hydrogen uh, is also used in other industries. For example, this fuel cell uh, is used in hydrogen-powered flying drones. As for a drone, a low weight and a high efficiency are key for a long flight time. These are also key elements for our car, which makes it the perfect choice. This energy then flows from the fuel cell to our battery pack. This is where it's temporarily stored until it's needed by our motor. And this is also where we made a big change. As last year, we used energy storage components called supercapacitors. These are very efficient, but they can only store a little bit of energy. And because of our different driving profile on the public roads, we'll have to stop for traffic lights, roundabouts, and uh, we need a lot more energy storage. That's why this year we made the change to lithium batteries, as they can store up to 50 times the energy for the same weight. But uh, as we have a battery that always has power, EcoRunner will also be, the EcoRunner 14 will also be the first one to start by only turning a key. And this electricity from the battery then moves to the motor, where it's converted into movement of the car. Also a place where we looked to the expertise of other fields. As when we were looking for the motor for Eco 14, we were looking for a motor that was more powerful, but also more efficient than any we had before. That's when we found the Mitsuba motor. This motor is originally designed for solar car racing, but together with Mitsuba, we customized its power profile, its speed range, and its operating voltage to work in our conditions. What makes this motor extra special is that it has an electronic shifting mechanism, and we can change the characteristics of the motor by just one press of a button. This also means that we can achieve our highest efficiency 
at two separate speeds, 45 and 65 kilometers an hour, which is perfectly tailored to use on the public roads as we won't be able to drive our whole three days at a constant speed. But our energy is not only used for the motor. One other challenge is the lights. As due to the strict uh, safety regulations, our lights have to be a lot brighter than previous eco-runners, more than 20 times. And brighter lights also mean a higher power consumption. This is why we work together with Hella Lights to find the most efficient possible solution. And alongside this, we found a very important exception in the rules of the RDW. If we made our car just smaller than one meter and 30 centimeters, we only had to have one central driving beam headlight. This means that it was just like a motorcycle and we can save a lot of energy when driving at night. But all this electricity doesn't go to the right place all by itself. And that's where our electronics department comes in. They are responsible for distributing the electricity not only to the right place at the right time, but also at the right voltage and current. And they do this with the use of PCBs, or printed circuit boards. And these PCBs are the brains and nervous systems of our car. And they are built and designed in-house by our two full-time electronics engineers. And every little chip or component you can see on these, these boards is hand-picked and has a specific function to all work together and make sure that when you press the pedal in the front, the motor starts turning in the back but also data is collected from all over the car, bundled, shown to the driver, and shown to our uh, support car in real time. Alongside numerous minor changes that they made compared to last year, they also faced a real big new challenge this year, the EMC test. EMC stands for electromagnetic compatibility. And this test makes sure that our car does not emit any unwanted signals from its electronics. At the same time, it also makes sure that our car is immune to electronic signals from other uh, products. An example of EMC uh, radiation is that you put your phone on airplane mode when boarding a plane uh, as not to interfere with any uh, instruments that they have on board. For us, this could mean that the lights are not supposed to flicker whenever you drive past a cell tower or that we won't interfere with the navigation system of the car driving next to us. And this strict uh, test is mandated for every product intended to be sold or used in the EU, from quantum computers to bread toasters, and also our Eco 14. And what makes this test so difficult is that this electromagnetic radiation can't be seen. You have to detect it in special rooms with special detectors and that's why we jokingly refer to it as trying to catch ghosts. Also, another thing that makes it so hard is that it's almost impossible to predict how certain electronic components will work together. Certainly a big challenge, but no match for our electronics department. So, Adrian and Arno, I could still talk for hours, but this was just a small view of all the changes that we made at the powertrain and electronics department. Wow, Stan. <laughs> Wow, Stan, that sounds like a real challenge. Now, I was wondering about something. If I were to take hydrogen in a glass of water, well, for example, this glass of water, then how far would the Eco 14 be able to drive on that amount of hydrogen? With the hydrogen from just that one glass of water, the Eco 14 will be able to drive 50 kilometers. That's all the way to Amsterdam. Wow, all the way to Amsterdam. <laughs> That's quite far. Stan, it was very interesting to hear all of this. Thank you for joining our podcast. Thank you. Now it's time for the last department. You've been looking at it for a while. It's the outside of our body. We like to call it the shell. And actually, the body department has already been very busy with the production of the body. And one of our graphic designers, Victoria, was just too curious to see how they were actually doing this. So she decided to go and visit them at their production location to get a sneak peek. 
Let's take a look. Did you know that Eco in our shell this year is less than 30 kilograms and that it's more aerodynamic than any production car? Today we are at our production location Poly Products in Werkendam and we will be taking a look at how we achieve this. Let's go! Hey Carolina! Hi Victoria! How are you? I'm good, thank you. And you? Good. Can you tell us how we start? Yes, of course. So this is the most important material we use, which is carbon fiber. And we use it because it's very strong and lightweight. Um, and we can see the fibers are all interwoven with each other. So it creates a very flexible sheet. OK, so this material looks very flexible, but how do we get it strong for the car? Right. So actually, we use the material called prepreg, which means that the resin is already infused in it. So then all we do is we apply vacuum to it and we cure it in the oven um, to obtain the desired strength and weight of the material. And we do this four times. And then we can actually see one example of an end result here. So, you know, you can even like, it's really strong, you know, so this is the end result after going to the oven. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I see a lot of separate elements in here. Can you tell me what they are? Yeah, so these are actually all the doors and panels of the car. And we decide to do them beforehand because we can, uh, by laying the pre pre carbon fiber on top of here, we create a flange. And so at the end of the process, we just glue all these panels to the shell through this flange and we make sure there's no gaps. So the shell will be as aerodynamic as possible. Wow, so after the carbon pre pre layup and the smooth shell, are we done? Well, actually, no. I forgot to mention that the shell does experience a lot of stresses in certain parts of the car, so we have to reinforce it. But Sam can tell you more about that. Hey, Sam. Hey, Victoria. We just learned that the car experiences different stresses. Can you tell us some more about that? Uh, during our design phase, we mapped out potential forces. And using finite element method, we calculate the stresses in the car, where red stresses are high stresses and blue stresses are low stresses. And using the fan, we could uh, determine where we really needed reinforcement. So what does this reinforcement look like? Um, I have an example right here. Uh, although you cannot see it when the car is finished, we make use of a sandwich construction where we use carbon, adhesive and a honeycomb shaped material called Nomex. Due to its hexagonal shape, it improves the bending stiffness of the carbon at a low weight cost. Okay, so do you use this everywhere? Not everywhere. We mainly use it in the floor, for example under the driver's seat or beneath the tank in the car. So what happens next? After we're done laying up all the pre prep and having the honeycomb where we want it. We're gonna vacuum the mold, cure it in the oven, after which the shell is finished and assemble it back in the dream hall. Okay, thank you, Sam. I'll leave you to it. We are looking forward to the end result. In just a few weeks, we will start putting together the parts of the Eco 14 and we will start driving. Stay tuned for more insights and developments of the Eco 14. Wow, Adrian, it's, uh, it's interesting to see that there's so much work behind uh, this shell. Uh, but it has a pretty interesting form. Do you know how we got there? Well, I think it's best to, to ask that to our chief body engineer, Jonas. Let's, let's invite him to the podcast. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Adrian and Arno, for inviting me. So, Jonas, tell me, how do you start designing the body of an eco-runner? Well, an eco-runner, everything is based on efficiency, and therefore our aerodynamic efficiency is very important. In order to explain to you how we design our shell, I'll first explain some of the aerodynamics. In aerodynamics, there are two types of flow. We have laminar flow and we have turbulent flow. In laminar flow, all the air particles are moving in the same direction without interacting with each other. This means there's not a lot of drag. And then we have turbulent flow. Turbulent flow, all the air particles are moving in different directions, 
hitting each other and causing drag. This is what we want to avoid when designing a car based for efficiency. So there are two situations. First, we have the desirable situation, where we have laminar flow. The air flows nicely around the top of a car without becoming turbulent. This is what we want. And then we have the undesirable situation, where the air flows around the body, but it can't follow the shape, becoming turbulent, detaching from the body. For my studies aerospace engineering, we learn about the most optimal shapes. And the most optimal shape for aerodynamics is an airfoil. An airfoil is basically a water droplet, but then a bit more stretched out. We use this airfoil in the EcoRunner, and it has been a major part of the EcoRunners for the past few years. For example, in the bottom of the car, we use the airfoil um, where the wheels are and the driver. We use this to limit the drag of this part. And then we, when we look at the top of the car, we also use this airfoil again in the top of the canopy. However, EcoRunner hasn't been... All, this year, EcoRunner is not only about efficiency. It's also... We have also had a lot of different challenges, starting with designing a car that has a license plate. This means we have to cut off the airfoil at the front and the back, which means the air cannot flo flow around the entire airfoil, causing a bit more drag. This is different compared to the Eco 13. Then we continue on to the mirrors. The RDW sets strict, strict requirements about the vision you have to have in the car, and therefore we need mirrors. However, for aerodynamic purposes, a camera system would be the best. But we did some calculations, and uh, we found out that with the aerodynamically optimized mirror we use, it only accounts for about 25% of the energy that would be used by a camera and its um, screens. Therefore, we use the mirror. So we achieved this by, again, integrating the airfoil shape in the connecting arm between the mirror and the body. And we also limited the size of the reflective surface as much as possible as allowed by the RDW, while still having the adequate vision that's required. Then we move on to the lights. In order to be visible on the road and to drive safely, we need to have lights. And the RDW has many requirements about uh, the position, the height, and the exact location of these lights. Therefore, we had to increase the back of the car by about four centimeters and also widen it a lot. This all um, causes a bit more drag, but it is unavoidable. But all these three requirements were all set by the RDW, by an outside organization. There have been, however, also uh, some parts uh, from other departments, since we're a well-coordinated team of engineers, and we have to adjust to their requirements as well. One of these things is the tank, the Big Bertha from PES. Since it's so big, we had to increase the height of the car by a significant amount, which also allows for a bigger driver. Now a person of 1,90 meter can sit in our car. So, if we look at all these changes in our CFD video, we can see how the air flows around the car. CFD is a technique uh, to analyze our airflow without the use of expensive wind tunnels. In this video, you can see uh, the amount of turbulent air there is. So the color indicates the amount of air, um, how much it's moving. And this is what we want to avoid, as I explained. But it's unavoidable. So if we look at the video, you can see at the top a bit more uh, separation and uh, turbulence due to our canopy, our flat back and flat front, and also our wheels causing some drag. And when we look at the top of the car, we can see how the mirrors affect our aerodynamics. It may seem from this video that our car is not very aerodynamic. That's, however, not the case. If we compare our car to cars currently on the Dutch roads, uh, our car is at least twice as efficient as any car on the Dutch roads. And if we look at similar sized cars, it can get as low as a quarter. Because for the, for the size of our car, we have an extremely efficient shape. So, even though there have been many requirements that negatively impact our aerodynamics, EcoRunner 14 is still the most efficient street-legal hydrogen car ever designed. The most aerodynamically efficient street-legal car. Wow, yes. that is a really nice title. Jonas, thank you for sharing the stage with us. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so Arno, now we have seen all the design decisions our team has made to ensure that our street legal car will still be as efficient as possible. We started by looking into the vehicle dynamics. 
and all its mechanisms to connect the road to the body. Then we moved on to the powertrain and electronics department, where we saw how hydrogen is used to power the movements of the car and all its electrical systems. Lastly, we discussed how the body of an eco-runner is designed to be as lightweight and aerodynamic as possible. So with uh, all this said, this was uh, the design of our car. And I'd like to give Xiao one more last word. I uh, can't wait to see this car on the public road. And seeing all of this presentation today uh, really makes me excited. And um, I think uh, one thing is for sure, uh, is that this year's EcoRunner will be the safest EcoRunner ever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Arno and Adrian, for this amazing podcast. And wow, what a great design that we accomplished this year. And what am I proud on this team to have accomplished this. At the beginning of this year, we decided to go for an untried and very ambitious goal. Therefore, we are challenging ourselves by creating a car that can actually drive on your public roads. And from here, we got to work, fully motivated with that license plate in our mind and to pass those 2,056 kilometers as our team target. However, there's more that keeps us motivated. It is our friends that ask us daily about how our project is going. It is our family where we come to rest after a busy week. And of course, evenings like these where we pause and realize our great accomplishments. And those are truly invaluable. Fortunately, after those busy days of working, we're still not done with each other. We have fun during break and lunches. We support each other when things don't turn out as expected. And of course, we celebrate achievements. For example, when we meet targets and deadlines. We went on several team weekends together, which were a lot of fun. And of course, our team drinks weekly on Friday are a great success. All resulting in a lot of fun and actually a very close group of friends. And that's the key to our motivation. And this motivation is reflected in the ability to inspire the people around us. The people of Delft whom we inspire by giving lectures about our story. The primary school kids whom we inspire by giving workshops during our school tours. All thanks to the amazing work of our operations department. And a very special thanks goes to our partners who place their trust in our team. Their products, expertise, and also financial support are vital to the success of our project. And without their help and positivity, the design and production of the EcoRunner 14 would not have been possible. So, before I invite the rest of the team onto stage, I invite all of you sitting here to join us for drinks at the Dream Hall afterwards. But now, most importantly, let's invite the team onto stage. So please, give a warm welcome for the rest of the management department. And of course, all the people who set up this event, our operations department. Please welcome the Vehicle Dynamics Department. Yeah, yeah. Please join us, Body Products Produ Production Department. <laughs> and of course, last but not least, our Powertrain and Electronics Department. Now we have displayed multiple models of previous eco-runners. And to make this line of models complete, we have presented to you the final design of eco-runner 14. <laughs> 